So, my name is Sam Jenks, and welcome to another episode of The Way We Source, a podcast hosted by Kodiak Hub, where we share our talks with procurement practitioners, procurement leaders, experts, consultants, content gurus, and people that we find downright inspiring. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting The Fixer of Dirty Data, a recent TEDx speaker, the author of Between the Spreadsheets, also known as The Classification Guru, Susan Walsh. Susan, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. Okay, so let's start with a question that I think is on everybody's tongue. The classification guru, where does it come from? Well, it's a self-appointed name. Uh, when, <laughs> I, when I set my business up five years ago, I didn't have any connections in the industry, uh, uh, which was procurement. And I want, I have classified data for 10 years. In the first five years, I researched so many websites where businesses didn't actually tell you what they did. So I wanted a name that people would look at and know what I did. And in a time where messaging's all over the place, clarity is appreciated. Very much so. And, but also I wanted it to be a bit fun. I wanted to get my fun, cheeky side across as well. So I thought, I'll just add guru to it. Um, and, you know, and that you do uh, very often, I think, also within your social media. So uh, I do. nice to see that. I'm going to start with a bit of a softball, but also a bit of a meta question here. What does really sourcing and procurement mean to you? Well, for me, it's all about the data. If you want to source anything you and procurement or procure anything, you need data to know exactly how much you need, hmm. how much you've bought before. Are you paying too much or I would say, wouldn't say too little, but <laughs> are you paying the right price? Are you mm. paying a range of prices from different suppliers? Are you negotiating with your suppliers? Often I hear that you know suppliers have the data and the information, not the procurement department. You know you need to know what's going on before you can negotiate the best deals. Otherwise, your mm. suppliers got the upper hand, and you'll never get the best deal. It should be a a win win for for both sides. And, and sorry, sorry about that. No, and then I was just going to say, and then things like, have you got fraudulent purchasing or rogue right. maverick spending going on in your department? How are you going to know that if you don't interrogate the data? And it's got to be clean data as well. It can't just be data. Right. So that's my... That's what it means to me. And it all comes back to data. I mean, it, there's a lot of insights that lie within the data and procurement is is privy to a lot of data, both within, you know, like you said, their own organizations, their own systems, but also within suppliers. So it is increasingly becoming important within everyone's digitalization journey. My question is really, what, what made you start working with data? Desperation is the answer. <laughs> Um, before I fell into spend data classification, I had a women's clothes shop here in Guildford in the UK and it failed miserably and I was absolutely broke. I had racked up a lot of debt. I couldn't even afford to go bankrupt. I had to save up to do that mm. and I needed a job and I needed a job quickly and I found an ad online and I knew I wouldn't be very good in a restaurant or anything like that. And I knew that working in retail didn't pay my bills. But I found this data classification, uh, data entry job. And I was like, well, I've worked in large companies. I know what they're buying things for. I can do this. Right. And that's how it started. Fantastic. It's so nice to hear when people take that journey from... Something that was completely, you know, a different passion project in life and being able to pivot back to something that uh, has become their new passion project, as, as yeah, I feel like and, data has for you. Yeah, and, and I think starting from the bottom really helps because right. I understand all aspects of it. I've been there. I've done it. I know. I can see the bigger picture because I've done it. And that really helps. Well, being that you've done it, I mean, because this is one of the things I wanted to talk to you about as well. What is your difference of experience in working in-house when it comes to dirty data versus working with it as a consultant as you are in your new role? 
believe it or not, you face the same challenges. You right. have the, you know, I have worked in, I came from the business side, not the data side, but I have worked with highly technical, introverted, not necessarily great with the customers, people. In fact, some where you can even let them near the customers because you <laughs> might lose the customers. Their, their social skills were not necessarily the best. And so kind of came became a bit a bit of a translator in that in that uh, scenario where you'd be the mediator between the data people and the business people and explain things to the data people and and back and forward and that really helped me with my messaging when I start this started this business right because I could understand both sides well, there's a lot of stories in the data, and I think that that's, that's the interesting part, right, is not just what the numbers say, um, but also what they're telling you, and oh, sometimes you so have much. to be able to, to analyze and, and create that. I, I think yeah. that we're finding out more and more, you know, in the companies that we're working with at, at Kodiak, and I'm sure that you are as well, you know, the digital journey is pervasive. It's going on in a lot of companies globally right now. Yeah, I'm curious because you have a unique insight in the sense that you also are working with a lot of multinational companies, especially on a very pivotal part of this digital journey, which is making sure that their data is clean. What is it that if you had to say something that they're getting wrong within their digital journey, within their, their data journey, what would you say? It's not investing in that upfront. They nor 99.9% of my clients come to me once there's a problem that it's Mm. not it's reactive not preventative right and that's the biggest problem they would save themselves a lot of time and money if they had considered the cleaning of and classification of data before they implement a new tool a new system right all those things and it's a challenge why do you think, because I'm sure that they know this themselves, why why do you think that they don't take that preventative action? Why why do they wait? Why does it become uh, reactive? Any, anyone can clean data. Anyone can classify it. Of course right. they can. It's dead right, easy. Right, right. Just give it to someone in the team. <laughs> That's fine. Exactly. And you know, you're 12 months later and you've only got halfway through it and it's not particularly great. And you know, what's going on? That's yeah. that's it's changing the perception and the value of this is is what I'm trying to do. It's a bit of that paralysis by analysis maybe as well, huh? That's, uh, it becomes too large of a project maybe even. I think if you, if you tackle it in small chunks, then it's fine. Um, I think that also from the top of an organization down, the further up you go, the less data literacy or knowledge around data and its importance and the skills required. Right. You know, it's, oh, you could just put it in a in a software tool, can't you? That'll fix it. Right. Mm, not quite. Yeah. How about work you did before that? Now, I'm interested, and for those that are out there listening, you know, maybe interested a little bit more in the services that you are providing, are you primarily prepping data to be utilized in larger projects within other solutions? Yes. Um, when I started this, uh, I was only involved in the classification and normalization of suppliers. I didn't get involved in the dashboards or the analytics. So I knew that I had Mm. to focus on what I was good at. And at that time, there weren't many, everybody was outsourcing their analytics. They were using third parties. Right. As as the years have gone on, a lot of that analytics has been brought in-house. But what they haven't realized is the amount of uh, cleaning and classification behind it. And and so there's uh, skills lacking in that area. And so the service that I provide and my team is we will normalize your suppliers, then we will classify them. And we normally build customized taxonomies for each client as well, because the off the shelf solutions don't really cut it anymore. Right. And then from that, they can go and put it into whichever system or tool they're using and they can do their own analysis and we can bring together multiple files and source systems for them as well. And then from that came supplier cleansing, tidying up addresses, completing missing information, tidying up the phone numbers, um, and cleaning ERP systems or CRM systems chain, you know, for changeover or upgrades, um, deduplicating all those records, making sure that they're correct, that there's not missing information, merging uh, rows together to make sure there's a single unique 
record for each client or customer or whoever it may be. Very exciting. And an important work, again, for the digital journey. Like you said, there's no, you know, there's not going to be a good output if there's a dirty input in any way. Yeah, like CRM systems for a retailer, Santa Claus, Michael Jackson, <laughs> um, you know, Elvis, all they were all in the in the supply in the customer right. database. Yeah, you know, we need to get rid of stuff like that. It's not good. No, I understand. I'm curious, you know, I asked what do you think the big companies are getting wrong when it comes to data? On the other side, what are they getting right? Oh, that's a really good question. I Nothing. think <laughs> the focus on no, I would I would say there there is more of a focus on data. I don't think they fully understand what they should be focusing right. on yet. But like I said, if you think back to five years ago when I started, there were no internal procurement data analysts or very few, um, or or da- in house data teams at all. That's changed massively in the last right. few years. So they are taking it more seriously, but. I think there's a little bit of, oh, everyone else is doing that, so we should do mm. that too, without without thinking about what do we actually need. But it's ma- mainly then in the organization shifts, uh, creating centers of excellence, data teams and the like. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Now I want to switch gears a little bit here and talk about something that I think is uh, 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 something that I've been in awe about whenever I, 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 I've I, I gotten in contact with you and with your brand, uh, if I may call it that, <laughs> which is your your yeah. social presence. It's it's amazing. I mean, you have nearly 30,000 followers on LinkedIn. I know. It's out of control. It's you crazy. are a rock star. The question is, how, how in the <laughs> heck did you begin your rise to this influencer status? It was not planned. <laughs> It was a complete accident and it was necessity. I, the first, I, I set my business up in June, five years ago. The first thing I did was eWorld procurement event in the September. And I did that uh, to test the waters with procurement professionals to find out if there was a need for my right. service. Turns out there was. But I also realized pretty quickly that I wasn't going to hit a huge number of people by going to events or emailing 100 people a day or whatever. Uh, And it's at a time when LinkedIn was growing and I had started to post. And I remember the first time I posted on a Friday and it was just something like, I love data, so you don't have to. (laughs) And it got a thousand views. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I'd been doing some local networking and I was finding it really difficult to explain to people Right. what I did. So I did a little video and filmed myself and talked about what I did. And that went down really well. And so then I did another one. And then I started doing some like picture posts about top tips and things like that. And it it just kind of snowballed from there. And and honestly, I like I've never used automation. I've never used a company to find me connections. I've grown those nearly 30,000 organically, wow. which means, well, yeah, it's a bit nuts to think about, you know, five years ago, I had like less than a thousand connections, I think. Yeah. And I think that it, there there but, is something in that, that your content is unique, you know, and it's authentic. Yes. Yeah. Also, it's, it's 30,000 mostly of the right people. Mm. So when I, when I share, I know that it's the right people that are going to see that message. Um, and like you say, I I guess I wanted to change the perception of data as being really boring right. and dry. I wanted people to see that there could be a fun side to data, that it could be really interesting and share why I loved mm. it so much. And it turns out that that was a really great tactic because it's worked really well. And now I'm doing crazy things like Lip Sync Sundays, <laughs> which which you wouldn't think would grow your business, but they do. Well, data doesn't have to be boring. Procurement and sourcing doesn't have to be boring. No, no, not at all. And I think that your, your content it really shows that. I'm curious, you know, when it comes to your content, do you feel pressure to create, you know, new, fresh, unique content? 
No, and and honestly, I haven't been able to do much new content recently. So I personally want to get more new content yeah. out there for me, not for anybody else. And and I think that's the difference potentially with me is everything I do is for right. me. It, it's not to please other people who are watching. Right. You know, I know that whenever I do this new content, when I've got time, they'll really appreciate it. But I recycle a lot of stuff. Um, and I also just talk about observations from the day. Things pop up in the day and I might want to just talk about them at the end of the day. So I don't plan anything either. It's very how I feel on the day is what I'll post. And I think that that, of course, is unique. You, you of course, have grown this, this following. You've grown this network that, like you said, you know, it's the right people. It's those that yeah. want to follow you in that case. So, so, so I think that 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 is that is definitely a position of power that you're within. Is is that you know the content you're going to create is going to be to a group of people that want you know they they, they feed on your content. Yes. However, the biggest thing I've learned from all of this is that the people who are interested in in, in being my clients are the ones that don't engage. They don't like my posts. They don't comment. They're sitting in the uh-huh. background hiding. <laughs> and then one one day they just come forward and say, I've been following you for years. Um, can you do, help me with this? And you don't even know they're there. They're just right. quietly observing in the background. Do you think that social selling has really propelled your brand? I mean, does it help you or get with making organic sales within your... Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. All my business comes in via LinkedIn. Wow. 100%. Yeah. Wow. Very impressive. What would you be your biggest tip? Because I'm sure that there's some procure tech vendors out there wondering, how in the heck do we differentiate ourselves? I mean, I, I, I want to ask you myself this question yeah. <laughs> for, for, for Kodiak Hub's sake. But I mean, how how is it? What would be your big tip, right? If anyone was listening to this as a procure tech vendor or, or a marketer, period, what would be your biggest tip to other vendors out there that are crying, trying to you know create and distribute content on social? Yeah, you you offer a range of different things, different products, services, whatever, whoever you are. Focus in on one thing and talk about that. Mm. Because me talking about classification, people do come to me and go, oh, can you also do this as well? Right. If you If you talk about a lot of different things, then you mix the message about what you do and what your services are. Whereas if you focus on just one thing and talk about that, it could bring in business for all different types of areas, but but you'll be known for that one thing rather than, oh, they do something, but I'm not sure what. So would it be more n- niche rather than try to be broad? I would say so. That's 100% worked for me. Uh, think about what, what are your clients looking for when they're Googling something or they're on LinkedIn? Right. You know, what, what are the problems that they're suffering with that you could catch their eye? with Mm. that they will go yes because that's you know i my tagline fixer of dirty data (laughs) has done more for me than anything else because everybody has dirty data everybody knows what that is i don't have to say anything else and it's it's actually quite a broad description so people come to me and ask me for help sometimes i can sometimes i can't but it it's broad but niche at the same time, I guess. Yeah. I think that that's a fantastic tip is is finding your lane, finding your niche and 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 not being afraid to to state it as well. Yeah, and I didn't start out, you know, with this perfect business. It's taken years to hone and refine my message and and all my marketing and branding. Right. And I've done most of that myself. You know, I haven't paid a fortune to a marketing agency to do this. You can do it yourself as well. Um, but, but yeah, I tried to be everything to everyone at the start as well. And that didn't work. As soon as I started just talking about one thing, that was it. Boom. Lots of interest. Very interesting. Very interesting. And great tip. I think to anyone listening. Yeah. Talking about something that is all over social right now. It's all over everywhere. I mean, look to your left, look to your right. It's, it's somebody talking about sustainability, about ESG, about goals, about reporting. Mm -hmm. And I want to switch gears to better understand, you know, how do you think that we're going to get towards, you know, a clean future with dirty data? Oh, good question. And actually very relevant. I was at an event last week and one of their days was a focus on sustainability. 
and they have a, a module where you can track how much carbon you're you're using if you buy this service or that product, etc. But to be able to match with that data, you have to have clean, accurate data yourself so mm. that it matches correctly. Um, so that's that's where where it, it all ties in. You need that accurate data in the first place to be able to match all the different data sets that are out there that are telling you if you're behaving and being you know, ethical and sustainable and avoiding risk. You, you won't know any of that without clean data. What would you consider to be kind of the most important data to be gathering in order to meet ESG goals? Because, you know, ESG is so broad. It's it's concrete goals related to actual, like you're saying, carbon, you know, uh, 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 water, waste, uh, electricity, uh, different types of emissions simply mm. uh, driven by environmental aspects, but also, you know, uh, of course, touching on the social aspects as well, uh, both from, from real output, but also from just simple compliance. So what would you say is like, the most important data set that that companies need to focus in on right now to get to a clean future? Your supplier data set, your supplier master data, the right name, the right address, uh, the right country they're based in, all that information. And what is that going to help then with ESG? Because at the surface, you know, that just sounds like supplier, you know, master data or information management. How does that help somebody drive their ESG goals? Well, you can try and and search for those companies within various databases if you've got the right information. Mm. Um, You know, you could have a company that's based in 10, 20 different countries and each one is has got a different rating for their ESG, whether it be sustainability or, you know, whatever. If you've not got the right address right. for the right supplier, you're going to have the wrong information and be making decisions. Like we might, you might think, oh, we're, do, we're doing business in this country and we're doing really well, but actually you're not because you were looking at a different country's ratings. And that could be diversity, that could be um, modern slavery, that could be all kinds of things yeah. uh, that it could relate to. So it really comes back to this idea of insights are great, but it all starts with the right input. You know, yeah. Otherwise, you're making the wrong decisions, and you could be open to, well, in terms of like modern slavery, if you're using suppliers that, you know, have been found to be in breach, then you could be in breach. You could be subject to fines. You could get terrible publicity and damage the reputation of your business, which is going to cost a lot more than paying a little bit of money to fix and clean your data. Great insights. I think that we need to start rounding off. But before we do, I want to jump into a session, a part of the the session that uh, we have with all of our guests. As you might remember, Kodak, the famous photography uh, brand. Yeah. Uh, well, they used to have a, a saying called the Kodak moment. You know, a, yes. a rare moment that you'd like to capture. I'd like to have a Kodak moment here with you very quickly, Ooh. Susan, if that's okay. Okay. Just to ask you a quick round of questions, pretty much, that without thinking, answer off the top of your head, all right? Oh, I love this. Yes, let's go. All right. Start with an easy one here. What's your favorite color? I'm going to say pink. What's the best city that you have ever visited? Oh, 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 I'm going to say Philadelphia. Wow. Not close to, not far from my hometown as well. Ah, shout well, out. That's that's pre COVID and pre <laughs> going crazy. All right, understood. What's your favorite cocktail? Uh oh, I'm gonna go with a uh, um, porn star martini. Wow. All right. And if there's <laughs> one book that you would leave anyone to read uh, after this episode, go out there, get on the shelves, buy it. What would you say? My book, Between the Spreadsheets, Classifying and Fixing Dirty Data. Um, And also because I am not a great reader. And so I would be terrible at recommending books. But you're a fantastic author. And with that, I thank (laughs) you so much for uh, guesting on our today's episode of The Way We Source. Thank you, Susan, for joining us. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun.